What's so easy about the poetry comparison question? Come with me and see. So I just start reading. Both poets write about the weather in winter. Awesome. So the examiner has already told me exactly what I need to find out about when I read the poems. There isn't going to be some deep secret meaning that I've got to unearth. So the first question is, do I read both poems or just one? Well, this part of the examiner's help is really useful. It says I can write about each poem separately if I want to. Now, I'm going to recommend that because it's the easiest. So I'm going to spend half my time writing about the first poem, and then the other half of the time I'll look at the next poem, I'll just compare it back to the first. Now, I'm going to read the poem twice. In the first reading, I just want to understand the plot. Let's give it a go. So my first reading is pretty quick. I did not sleep last night. Okay, so I know who the who is. The falling snow was beautiful and white. Oh, I actually know what the mood is as well. It's kind of calm and peaceful, isn't it? I dressed, sneaked down the stairs and opened wide the door. So this is still at night time. The narrator is being a little bit secretive. I had not seen such snow before. Our grubby little street had gone. The world was brand new and everywhere there was a pureness in the air. Okay, so the mood is kind of excited and happy. And this is happening maybe for the first time that this child can remember. Now, I'm assuming it's a child because they hadn't seen the snow before. That's a really good clue. If they were old, they would have seen snow like this. I felt such peace. Watching every flake, I felt more and more awake. So that's quite interesting. Maybe this person doesn't have a peaceful life normally, but now that everything's quiet with the snow, now it feels peaceful. I thought I'd learned all there was to know about the trillion million different kinds of swirling, frosty falling flakes of snow. Wow, I enjoyed saying that. So the mood now is again quite excited, playing around with the sound of language. Did you spot all that alliteration there? I'm not going to worry about that now because it's not the plot. But that was not so. I had not known how vividly it lit the world with such a peaceful glow. Upstairs, my mother slept. Aha! So we're back to being a child again. And this is an extra beautiful bit of snow that we don't normally get. And also, if it's vividly lit, there's something interesting about the nighttime light. That could be electricity lights or it could be the moon. I don't know yet. Let's read on and find out. I could not drag myself away from that sight to call her down and have her share that mute miracle of snow. It seemed to fall for me alone. How beautiful our grubby little street had grown. So the narrator might be somebody in their 30s or 40s living at home, but that's not so likely. It sounds much more like a child, and the child is used to calling their mother down at night but isn't going to do it this time because they feel it's their own little secret and own the miracle just for them. The snow seems so special. We've got the repetition of what the grubby street is normally like, so this is a big deal in the narrator's mind, how disgusting the street is normally or how disappointing with grubby, and now it looks clean, because clean is the opposite of grubby, with all the beautiful snow. And I love this idea that it's a miracle. So that's another reason why the narrator feels excited. It's so special. And it seems for me alone, just for them. Okay, I fully understand the plot now. All right. Well, now I'm actually going to answer the question. How do I do that? I do my second reading, which is let's just go through the bullet points in the question and try to answer each one as we go. The content of the poems, what are they about? So I'm going to begin. The persona in the poem feels excited about a special snowfall that occurred last night. The main excitement seems to be that the snow has arrived specifically for this child, for me alone. This feels like a miracle, the most exciting part of the experience is when the persona feels that their street has been transformed from grubby to beautiful. 
Well, let's start with why I've called the person in the poem a persona. That's because we don't know that it's the poet. Brian Patton, the poet, could be inventing somebody to have this experience in the poem. So we can always use this word to describe the character in the poem. Did you notice, as I was thinking, I automatically used words from the poem? And I can just put quotation marks around them now. Now, notice I haven't written about whether these are metaphors or similes or adjectives or any of that stuff. I've just picked quotations which I noticed when I was thinking about the plot. So I've got an absolutely brilliant first paragraph. Yours doesn't need to be as detailed as this, but it's a brilliant first paragraph that answers what the content of the poem is about. Now, you will also notice that I've already begun to think about the poet's idea, which was the excitement the poet was feeling. Now, there isn't a mystery in trying to work out what the poet was trying to make us think about. All we have to do is ask, well, what's the persona thinking about in the poem? We could talk about the repetition of the grubby little street that's here and at the end. Or we could talk about how the air is pure or the feeling of peace. Or we could focus on this greedy idea of not wanting to share the experience with his mother. So we're just going to pick a couple of those to write about. At the end of the poem, the persona repeats the phrase grubby little street, which suggests that he probably lives in a poor part of town that always looks depressing. However, now that the snow has fallen, the world has been transformed with beauty so that it is beautiful and white. This is such a wonderful experience that he calls it a miracle of snow. When he says that this miracle is mute, meaning silent, we also get the idea that his normal life in the city is loud and that he doesn't like that. We get the idea that such peace isn't just a feeling of calmness. He's also really grateful for quiet. Now, again, you don't have to write as much detail as I did there, just thinking out loud. But I hope you can see how to write about the poet's ideas as you spot them in your second reading. If you had only spotted two, that would be plenty. OK, the next bullet point is about the mood and atmosphere. Well, actually, I've written quite a lot about the mood and atmosphere already, haven't I, when I'm talking about this calmness and the excitement and the world normally being depressing but now being beautiful. So I've already answered a lot of that bullet point. So I go back to the poem and I think, well, I want to use the words mood or atmosphere in my answer just to show that I'm answering the whole question. Where can I find something that shows me the mood? Well, I can talk about the world being brand new. That's a, an atmosphere. Or the pureness in the air. That's an atmosphere, isn't it? Or I can have this idea that we started with, that he's sneaking down and it's his own little secret that he's not going to share with anyone. And that's even his mother at the bottom there. So that's the one that jumps out to me most. I could write about any of them. I'm going to pick that one. The poet's persona is in a secretive mood, which is why he sneaked down the stairs. By the end of the poem, he has decided even to keep this special scene from his mother, because he doesn't want to share that mute miracle of snow. The atmosphere is so special that the persona wants to keep it for me alone. Perhaps the persona normally feels that they have to share everything and is excited to have a special moment that they don't have to share with anyone else. Now again, you wouldn't have to write about as much, just a couple of quotations would do. But notice the words in green. I keep using the words that are in the bullet points. In this bullet point, atmosphere in mood. And in the previous bullet point, we needed to talk about the ideas. Let's go back and check that. Ideas, mood and atmosphere. OK, so all the time I'm using these words that the examiner's kindly given me to help me get the marks. I've already written about lots of words and phrases 
But now I've got to talk about something being interesting and something being organised. Now, the examiner hasn't got something interesting that they want you to find. It can literally be anything in there that you find interesting. Well, there are two easy ways to look at how poems are organised. One is what gets repeated, and two, hey, it's a poem, is there any rhyme? Night, white, stairs, door, before, gone, everywhere, air, flake, awake, no kind, snow, so, lit, glow, slept, sight, share, snow, alone, and grown. Now, my top tip here is if I always write about the beginning and the end, I'm always showing the examiner that I've dealt with the whole poem. Sneaky, eh? So I've got night and white. Well, I notice that the first two lines are a rhyming couplet, night and white, and alone and grown. Hey, another rhyming couplet. Okay, well, how's that? trying to make me feel i did not sleep last night the falling snow was beautiful and white well it's supposed to make me feel that this is marvelous okay let's check the one at the end it seemed to fall for me alone how beautiful our grubby little street had grown yes that's still marvelous but now the difference is that that marvelousness is all for me alone just for the persona I'll write about that then. The poem begins and ends with a rhyming couplet. The mood of these couplets emphasises how wonderful the experience is when the snow falls. However, at the end, the persona is excited that this miracle of snow isn't happening for the benefit of everybody. It is a special moment for them alone. Okay, remember I said that repetition and rhyme are easy ways to show how the poem is organised. Like any poem you meet is going to have some repetition or rhyme in it. We could also argue that looking at the beginning and the ending is also how the poem is organised. So I fully covered that bullet point. Now I need to write about how they are similar and how they are different. So we simply go to the next poem. My window pane is starred with frost. The world is bitter cold tonight. The moon is cruel and the wind is like a two-edged sword to smite. Well, you probably don't know what the word smite means. Can we work out what's going on? It's frosty. It's night time again. The moon is cruel and the wind is like a two-edged sword. Well, that's pretty violent, isn't it? So the wind is violent. The moon is cruel. I have no idea what that means but I don't care. I've got enough to know that it's night time, the wind is definitely cold and cutting like a sword, and is frost on the glass. God pity all the homeless ones, the beggars pacing to and fro. Okay, so this person is in their cold room themselves, but they're actually worried about other people outside who don't have their own rooms because they're homeless. God pity all the poor tonight who walk the lamp-lit streets of snow. So it's a religious person, they're praying to God twice here, look. So this is a Christian who's worried about the poor who are poorer than they are, the homeless. My room is like a bit of June. Mm, right, so obviously it's very warm in the persona's room. Warm and close curtained, fold on fold. But somewhere... Like a homeless child, my heart is crying in the cold. Although the house is really warm, this person feels very cold, and it's as though their heart is crying like a homeless child. Well, they're obviously not a homeless child, but they're feeling homeless. Their own emotions could be linked to this praying for all the homeless people. So they might be feeling... Um, as though they need to cry because other people aren't as lucky as they are. So I now know enough about the plot to start making comparisons. So both take place in streets of snow. But this one isn't cheerful, is it? So we've got words like cruel and bitter to show that this is not a cheerful night. Right, here we had the mood of the persona. Here, this persona is worrying about other people well, that's different, isn't it, to this poem where the, the persona thinks about their mother but then <laughs> decides to do without her and just enjoy this sensation on their own. 
So here, the feeling of being on their own was great, whereas here, the feeling of being on their own reminds them of a homeless child who is alone and miserable. So in this one, the snow makes the world a more magical place, more like a miracle, but here, the snow makes the world more dangerous and horrible for those who are trapped in the weather. In the second poem, the persona is trying to make people's lives better, whereas in the first, they're entirely selfish. So we've looked at the similarities of the content, and we've looked at the similarities of the ideas, and of the mood and the atmosphere. Well, this is also organised with rhyme, isn't it? Frost, night, wind, smite. One's fro, tonight, snow. June, fold, child, cold. Well, we can say that rhyme is either to make something feel cheerful or something feel sad. In the first poem, we talked about the rhyming couplets, which gave us this happy feeling of peace and wonder. Well, here we can say there aren't couplets. The rhymes happen alternately. So fold with cold and fro with snow. And so we can say these rhymes try to emphasise a feeling of sadness. Now, the other thing we can look for is whether the sounds are harsh or soft. Frost, night, wind, smite. Can you hear how those are harsh sounding endings to the words? June, quite soft. Fold, quite soft. Child, cold. The k changes from the soft sound of fold to the harsh sound of cold. So I can talk about the deliberate use of harsh sounds in this poem, which links with the harsh conditions that the homeless child or homeless people might be facing in the cold snow. Are there any bits of repetition I could write about? Well, we've got God pity all, God pity all, right in the middle of the poem. So we could write about the importance of this prayer and how the persona wants to help. So they're asking God. And then when we get to this miserable ending, but somewhere like a homeless child, my heart is crying in the cold, perhaps the persona feels that God isn't going to help. And that gives me the idea, maybe, that the persona maybe doesn't believe that God is ever going to help. Maybe that's why their heart is crying. Now, the final thing I have to worry about is whether I have spotted some poetic techniques. I'm saving that to last because that's just the icing on the cake. Annoyingly, this poem is absolutely full of poetic techniques that I could write about, but annoyingly, I started with this one. So we're going to go back to this poem and what I wrote and see what to do next. Okay, this is what I wrote. If I spot techniques as I'm writing, I'm going to name them and put them in. However, I'm leaving some time at the end of my answer to go back and add techniques in. Well, I've got rhyming couplet as a technique there, so that's pretty good. But you know what the big ones are, aren't they? They're similes, metaphors, personifications. So I'm just going to go through and see if there are any similes, metaphors or personifications that I've quoted and haven't named. Well, yes, the miracle of snow. Snow isn't actually a miracle, so that is a metaphor. So I'm going to add that in here. This is such a wonderful experience that he calls it a miracle of snow. When he says that this miracle is mute, all right, so that's a personification now because people can choose to be quiet. Instead of says, I'm going to have personifies. When he personifies this miracle as newt. Brilliant, so I've spotted that as a technique. Now I could put metaphor in here with the miracle of snow, but look, I've noticed that I've used the miracle of snow here as well. So I'm going to see if I can put it in to share that miracle of snow, the atmosphere of this metaphor. So that's plenty. I've got my metaphor, I've got my personification, I've got my rhyming couplet, that's loads of examples of techniques. And it's worth pointing out that when I refer to the person in the poem as a persona, I'm already getting the examiner on my side about the sort of language that I'm using. Hello and welcome to a Mr. Sally's first A Welsh Board video. Let's see how you get the marks when you're comparing the unseen poems. You're going to find this super useful 
super easy. We are using the 2019 paper and just take a look at how much the examiners want to help you. The first thing that you notice is they tell you what the poems are actually about. The first thing you notice is that they tell you what the poems are actually about. They're both going to be about the weather. Then there's some information which will be useful to you. I'm going to skip that for the minute because this happens with every single question you get. They then tell you exactly what they want you to write. It's as though they're giving you the answers. They are giving you the answers. So let's tidy this up into a sexy little PowerPoint and see how it works. So let's tidy this up into a gorgeous PowerPoint and see how it works. Here's the question just presented a little bit differently. Both poets are writing about the weather. OK, I'm going to write about how they write about the weather. It then tells me the names of the poems. Cool. Write about both the poems. Right, I'll remember how to do that. And I've got to write about the effect on me. Now that's really important. Often students look at a poem and think, well, what the hell do I write about here? And this says from the examiner, anything you like, however it affects you. There's no answer in the examiner's head that you've got to kind of get to. It's all about what's in your head. Well, great. I'm really familiar with what's in my head. I'm going to pass this exam. Now I have to show how the poems are similar and how they are different. OK, well, I'll make sure that I do that. We'll see when we read two poems, there's bound to be something similar and bound to be something different. I already know that they're going to be similar because they're about the weather. And because it's an exam, I can be pretty certain without ever looking at the poems that they're going to have different opinions about the weather. So I will always be able to write about the difference. OK, you may write about each poem separately and then compare them. Now, I recommend this. It's the easiest way to do it rather than have two poems side by side and try to work out what's similar and different. That's too hard. Why don't I just write about one poem and then when I get to the next poem, I'll be thinking, hmm, is this different or is this similar to the last poem? And then I can make my comparisons where appropriate. Now, this is a bit of a naughty word comparisons here because in everyday English language, when you compare something, you're saying how it's similar to something else. But for this exam, when we're saying we're comparing, we're also looking at differences. Right, I'm ready to meet the question. OK, I understand what this question is asking me to do. Let's take a look at those bullet points. First, we get this instruction. You may wish to include some or all of these points. Well, may is not the right word here. That's basically there for students who can't think of anything, but that's not you. So you are going to answer all of these points and you must do it. Why? Because you want full marks on the foundation question and full marks is possible for nearly everybody. Let's take a look at the bullet points. Now, these bullet points are fantastic because they tell me exactly how to structure my answer. I'm going to write a bit about the content, then I'm going to write about the ideas, then I'm going to write about the mood and atmosphere. So actually, I don't really have to think too much. The examiner has already given me an essay plan. Oh, I love the Welsh. Thank you very much. I'm just going to follow that structure. I've got an essay plan. Now, let's dive in to what words I'm going to use in my essay. Well, I'm actually going to start by using the word content. The content of both poems is similar. I can write this before I even see the poems because I know they're both about the weather. So that's what I'll say. The content of both poems is similar because they write about the weather. Cool. Then I'm going to write about the poet's ideas. Now that's really cool because I know most students will just write about the poem and they won't think why the poet is writing this poem. What's the poet's idea? So my next sentence might be, the poet's idea about the weather is... Boom, boom, boom. I don't know what that will be yet. 
but that's what I'm going to write about. And then I know that that weather is going to create a mood or an atmosphere. Well, I can predict that it might be something comforting or that it might be something sinister or that it might be something dangerous. Well, I'll find out when I get to the poems, but I know what mood is. Mood is how does it make me feel about whatever it is that's being described in the poem, the weather. Now, if I use the words mood and atmosphere in my answer, I'm going to get top marks. So that's what I'll do. Other vocabulary which I'll use are going to be the other bits in yellow, which you'll see as we go through the poem. Right, in the exam, I'm not going to understand everything all at once. So the first time I read the poem, I'm just going to understand the plot. And by understand the plot, I mean work out who is in the poem, what's going on, when's it happening, where's it happening, and why is it happening. 